Welcome. Uh, welcome to the second live stream of Reskilled. My name is Aurelia. I'm one of the European coordinators of Reskilled. And today we are hosting our second live stream um, with our national partners of France, uh, Farah Pesh. Um, today we will talk about the Not in My Backyard phenomena and how to transform it into a welcome in my backyard phenomena. And now I will give the floor to our host, Rogier. Rogier, the floor is yours. Uh, go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Rogier. If you're not from the Netherlands, just stick to Roger or Roger. I listen to everything. Uh, I'll be your moderator because besides uh, a board member for Rescaled, uh, my job is being a moderator. And normally I would say never mix something uh, where you are a moderator and where you have an opinion. Uh, but here I, uh, I'm making it a lesson also because I want to form an opinion about Nikki. Uh, so it's my job to guide you to this program in the next one hour and 15 minutes. So we have a lot to do, so uh, let's dive into it. Um, we have quite a nice program for you. Um, where is my toggle for that's here? Uh, we have a few things to do. Um, first, we're going to do a little introduction. Why should we be talking about, uh, yes, in my backyard, or we talk about reskilled? When we do this, we kind of uh, suspect all of you to, to know a little bit what reskilled is. Um, so uh, if you have missed our last broadcast, uh, at Rescaled, we believe that everybody who is incarcerated, and we can have a discussion whether we should people incarcerate or not, but if that happens, it should be for, uh, with three conditions. One, it should be on a small scale, so people feel more like in a house than in a mega prison. Two, the program and security level should be fitted to uh, their circumstances and their, their, their person. And three, it should be embedded in the community. And maybe that is also why we should talk about the backyards, because we will be in people's backyards. Well, secondly, we're going to uh, listen to some uh, lessons from research because there are prisons and also small skilled facilities in people's backyards. Uh, we have some uh, research about how it is approached and how it could be approached. Then we are uh, going to zoom a little bit to our host today, which is the French engineer Farah And they already have farms around France, and they have experience with how to involve the community and how to make people welcome them in their backyards. Now we're going to talk about a little bit the theory of how of community processing. If you want to involve a, a community, how do you do it? Which steps you should follow in our backyard? Um, to get started, here's uh, uh, Emily Adam. You're from Farapesh. You're the host of uh, today because every country that's associated with uh, Rescale or has a Rescale chapter in a country has to organize a, uh, a live stream about one of the barriers we think we might face when we want to build these houses. Um, what does Farapesh do? So, a quick word uh, on Farapesh. Farapesh is an NGO based in France uh, and a proud partner of Rescaled. Uh, in short, Farapesh federates French NGOs working in the prison and justice field and provides training for people who want to learn more about justice and prison. Uh, but uh, later we want to, uh, of course, we want to implement in France and other con in other countries in Europe, some uh, uh, detention houses. So in a very concrete way, the question of NIMBY and acceptability will arise when setting up detention houses in France. Uh, it's already the case, as you know, with the new prisons uh, that are built. Isabelle Leroux will tell uh, more about that. And of course, with the EMRS farms, and we will show you later a video about the farms. Well, what do you hope that this meeting today will help us? What, what should get out of it? Um, maybe that the most important obstacles are in, identified when implementing projects that accommodate people who have been sentenced to deprivation of liberty, and above all, to highlight maybe the means to overcome them. Uh, as you know, one of the pillars of Rescale is that the houses are integrated in the community, so even though it's difficult to face these obstacles, it also means that the, the, the local environment is concerned. Um, it also raises the question of what uh, binds a community together, the values it stands for. Uh, is it the welcoming, the hospitality, or the exclusion of, its, of uh, outsiders? So now it's up to us to show the positive elements brought uh, by the houses and by the people who live there, uh, of course. So we could say, uh, if people don't want our houses in their backyards, so that's really annoying for our project. We could also say, this means something because our houses are supposed to be integrated in the community. So if 
nobody cares that it's in their background, then we also have a problem. Totally <laughs> true. <laughs> yes, no, it, it's true. We, I think, we will succeed something if, as you as you said, as you said, um, people are concerned. If they are not, maybe we'll miss the, the one of the pillars we want to uh, to 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 have in the detention houses. Okay. Well, then, thank you so much. We have an expert uh, in our midst who researched how this works. Uh, Isabel Lavour is a researcher and teacher in economics and currently works at Angers University. She researched in institutional economics um, and her research focuses on the territorial location of organizations such as firms, non-profit organizations or prisons. And she also works on uh, public-private contracts and contractual efficiency applied to the French uh, carceral public policy. And she uh, uh, prepared a presentation for us to give us some answers on um, some of the arguments we can face when we want to build these things in people's prisons. Isabel, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice to meet you, to meet you all. Thank you very much. Yes. And uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, accepting our, uh, our invitation uh, to speak. Um, so, first of all, in France, I know in the Netherlands we always build our prisons in um, uh, industrial zones, so that there are no neighborhoods. How is that in France? Yes, that's uh, always the case. In fact, new French prisons tend to be located in the urban periphery and in uh, micro isolated areas. Uh, they are uh, often located in declining or decommissioned uh, areas. As for an example, so this prison is located uh, between a highway and uh, a big road. Um, across the road, you have an industrial zone. After you have uh, uh, companies, uh, streets, a railway, uh, we call that uh, discontinuities. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, uh, a way to isolate the prison. Uh, prison uh, a prison can be in the middle of the woods. That's the case here. A prison can be hidden by an artificial hill, so it's a case here, so it's hidden. Uh, in Le Mans uh, case, so uh, it's a city uh, in France, not far away from Paris, uh, the prison uh, is in the middle of the field, so it's, it's near the, the city, but in fact it, it's, it is uh, micro-isolated because when uh, inmate uh, families want to uh, to go uh, and see uh, uh, the, the the inmates. They they have difficulty to uh, to reach a prison because there is no bus lines and so on. And uh, if if you are an inmate uh, and and you you have to work uh, on the day, as for an example, uh, the uh, jobs uh, employment areas are in the south uh, of the city, so it's difficult to to reach those areas. So that's really uh, it can really be a problem, and the. The most dramatic situation is the situation of Poitiers. Uh, so uh, the, the prison is at around 20 kilometers from Poitiers uh, in, in the middle of the fields and, uh, family and families and lawyers um, meet a lot of difficulties uh, to go there because uh, for a lawyer, as an example, uh, it takes half a day to do the in and return, so they don't go and see the inmates very uh, often, and that's the same thing for families. Uh, so uh, Vivon is a, a new prison, uh, but it's a modern and a human prison for, for this uh, reason. So, okay, so that's uh, what I guess. Uh, so yeah. just in, in the end, so in the end, the problem is that semi custodial centers are always half empty or half full, as you want, uh, because prisoners uh, do not have access to an, em an employment areas and they are isolated. So the prisons are isolated and the inmates are isolated uh, as well. 
So yeah. it leads okay, to so receive a DVC. Yes. Okay, so that's a very good thing. So we want them more close to people, but then, yeah, uh, what 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 happens if people hear that there will be a prison very close to their houses? Um, so if you have a house near a prison, yes, uh, NIMBY, you have you can you can meet a lot of NIMBY uh, problems. As for an example, so NIMBY problems occur. Uh, one local uh, population overestimates the perception of risks, uh, whereas the prison is a low risk facility, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, NIMBY conflicts can uh, also be due to noise or visual nuisance. Uh, they can be due to the loss of amenities. Um, to uh, the loss of property values, to the feeling of insecurity, as you you, you know so that just before. Uh, I give you some examples. Uh, the first one, uh, so uh, people uh, are unhappy, are angry. Uh, they are okay to help the inmates, but they don't want them in, uh, in their backyard. They want... Uh, a prison, a farm far away from their house. Um, in this case, just uh, on the right, uh, it's a case of uh, a wine grower. He has a castle and uh, that's the same thing. It's, a, it's really a, a problem and the project has been abandoned um, because um, he uh, made a, a lot of pressure uh, on a political, on a representatives, on local communities, and so on. Uh, this man uh, is also uh, angry because the prison is uh, is uh, near his uh, est estate, and sometimes uh, we we can meet very curious uh, cases. Uh, as for an example, so one of the two uh, houses has been sold. Uh, to the uh, carceral administration, but not the others. So it leads to uh, chalices and to a lot of conflicts. And we could uh, we could avoid uh, all that. But um, nimbic conflicts are one part of the problem because a lot of conflicts around prisons are generated uh, by uh, mayors by uh, political men who want absolutely a prison uh, on uh, their territory, on their local community. So uh, it, can be due to that, uh, it, it can be due to that as well. Uh, and why do mayors want a prison so badly? Um, in fact, uh, no, no. In fact, uh, some mayors don't want a prison. So in, in this case, you have NIM, NIMBY problems, so population, uh, don't, populations don't want to prison, and mayors are with the population, so they fight together. But you can have an, another uh, situation, and in this second situation, mayors uh, want uh, a prison absolutely on their territory for different reasons, because they think uh, it will bring a lot of economic value, uh, economic development, and so on. But that's not, that's not true. So uh, they built uh, false arguments, and uh, it can really be a problem uh, for populations. OK, but so what we saw, if I summarize you, people in general are positive to rehabilitation of inmates. They think prison should be there and we should help these people, but not next to my house because then it's dangerous. My property will go down, etc. And then the mayor says, yes, but it will be very well for our economy because we can sell things to this prison and people can work there. But then people say, nah, we don't really believe it. And it actually also is the case because they can't really sell things to the prison. In, in fact, mayors, uh can uh, sometimes lie and uh, they can persuade a population with uh, false arguments. I give some, some arguments. 
Uh, as for an example, Myers uh, say uh, you will see arrival of new populations of families of warders. They will live here, so we will build new uh, new houses. We will uh, sell more. Uh, you will see more uh, firms on our uh, local uh, community, and so on and so on. It will create jobs, economic development. And uh, our research uh, shows uh, it's not true. It's not true for several reasons, uh, because in fact, if I take the example of warders, uh, they don't want to live near the prison. In fact, they live in another township, but not, uh, not near the prison. So uh, families uh, don't come and live near the prison. That's not true. Uh, so, um, it's it's difficult, so uh, it's it's di it's difficult, and people uh, finally think uh, think it's true. And after you have uh, uh, other arguments uh, who are uh, false as well, such as uh, tax receipts, uh, pre so pre prisons uh, don't pay tax because it's the French states and French states don't pay tax to French states. Um, in certain case, uh, you can have a public uh, private uh, prisons. So we call that PPP, pub public private partnerships. Uh, in this case, the prison is uh, built and ex exploited by uh, industrial groups such as uh, Bouygues uh, or Vinci. And in this case, uh, these big groups uh, don't buy, don't uh, purchase uh, goods and equipment uh, in the township, in the township where the prison is set up, because in fact, they have a, a lot of prisons all, all over the country, and they have national purchasing center where they, they buy uh, all the goods and equipments so uh, in fact, uh, the town cheap doesn't benefit from uh, from that, from except it for cigarettes, because ah, okay. there is a rule uh, that uh, ob um, ob obliged uh, the prison to buy cigarettes in the township. But that's okay. A, so we we sell an, a an few cigarettes. Yeah. Okay. So the back the back uh, adds a little bit of uh, revenue. Okay. So. Um, and I can imagine uh, if you if people feel that they're lied to, that they were promised things, they will fall for it once, but never twice. Um, now let's make a, a, the step to our idea of a prison, which is not a big mega prison built somewhere with a big fence around it, but a smaller thing embedded in a community with contact with the community. Would you say that's easier, it's more difficult to convince because the walls are lower. So people might think, oof, maybe someone will escape or easier to convince people because they think, wow, here that we might sell them more than just cigarettes. Um, I think it could be easier if the structure uh, is smaller and if uh, you have a lot of interaction between inside and outside the structure, it's easier because uh, you create a sort of link between uh, populations, between inhabitants and uh, inmates. So uh, I think it's really uh, a, a good thing uh, to develop very small prisons and small prisons that are encouraged within uh, the local community, within uh, the prison. Uh, I can show you, if, if you want, I can show you uh, uh, a, sc a scheme I worked on. Uh, we call that, in uh, research, we call that an hybridization uh, as a win-win process. Uh, the prison is encouraged within territory and territory works with the prison. And uh, to do that, to, um, to attempt this objective, you have to do, of course, an educational and awareness uh, raising work uh, with population, 
with associations and so on. It's really uh, uh, hard work to do and it can take several years. years. And uh, the problem in France is that the prison, when it arrives, it arrives suddenly. Sometimes uh, uh, local communities are waiting uh, five years, 10 years without, without news about the prison. And suddenly the prison is built. And here it's really uh, a pity uh, because you break all you break all the the, the link uh, you could build uh, b between uh, territory and populations yes. and here i give you if you want i give you an example in the south of toulouse it's 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 a good example uh, of the muret uh, prison so the muret prison uh, has been Built, it, it's a, it's an old prison, but uh, they developed, in fact, uh, relation chips with the aerospace cluster. So near the prison, you have uh, the aerospace cluster. It's it's in Toulouse, in the south uh, of France, and uh, inmates uh, work uh, with the aerospace cluster. Uh, they developed. Uh, um, conventions between the prison and the territory and uh, inmates can validate qualifications. So it's not the case of a small structure, it's a bigger structure, but a structure that is encouraged within the territory and uh, able to develop the real link. So here it's uh, a professional link, but you can develop cultural links as well. Uh, yes. social it, links and so on. It's okay. It's doable. It's not easy. It takes time, and you should not be lying by how we're doing it. But uh, at the first one, we ask people what are the main reasons why people might not want to prison in a backyard is security concerns. Um, uh, can can you say okay, it might be a bit dangerous, but there will be economic and cultural benefits, or should we say whatever it is, it's don't you don't have to be afraid because security is taken care of. Uh, uh. No, a prison is not dangerous. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, an inmate uh, escapes. That's true. But uh, in most of the case, uh, in the evening, he he come back to home. He come back to the prison, knock at the door, and 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 come back home because he he, he can't do anything without. Uh, Without, without money. So no, you, so a, a prison is a low risk facility. Yes, but, and, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we, we should keep saying it's, that. It's yeah. not, you, you are not in insecurity around the prison. That's not true. <laughs> that, okay, that's at first, but uh, uh, we, we might uh, first have to really uh, reassure people that the safest place for people is next to a prison. Okay, thank you yes, so much for this. Yes, sometimes, <laughs> yes, living near a prison, it's uh, the, the safest place. <laughs> so this is an optimistic story because basically all the uh, economic promises that mega prisons don't deliver, we could deliver with our houses, but we have, you're reminding us, don't just build it overnight and then hope that there's no resistance, but take your time because it's a long-term uh, project. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, thank this you, Chief. Yes, okay, so this is something uh, we, can, we can definitely learn from. In French, the uh, Emma House Farms for inmates are an example for inmates at the end of the sentence. And, um, and of course, when they are built, because they are built around France, of course, they also stumbled into some, uh, some nimby arguments. Let's see how they worked with that. Les fermes Emmaüs sont conçues comme des sas de reconstruction pour les personnes qui sortent de détention, un sas entre la prison et la liberté totale, principalement conçu pour les personnes sortant de longues peines. Ce sont des structures associatives qui proposent à la fois un hébergement avec un mode de vie familial, c'est-à-dire une vingtaine de résidents maximum, un accompagnement socio-professionnel renforcé et une activité professionnelle en insertion sur une activité de maraîchage et d'élevage biologique. Les personnes qui sont accueillies sont encore sous 
mesure judiciaire dans le cadre d'un aménagement de peine appelé le placement à l'extérieur. Actuellement, il y a trois fermes en fonctionnement. La structure historique, la ferme de Moyen-Brie, qui fait du placement à l'extérieur depuis 17 ans. Euh, la ferme d'Emmaüs les Spinassières, qui est située dans le sud de la France et qui a ouvert en 2018. Et la ferme Emmaüs Bedon, à proximité de Bayonne, qui a ouvert en 2020. Aujourd'hui, six projets euh, sont accompagnés par le mouvement Emmaüs, euh, dont le prochain ouvrira euh, au début de l'été près de Nantes. On a aujourd'hui des réactions diverses et ambivalentes face à l'implantation de ce type de projet. Pour une certaine partie, on a de la part des populations un accueil très positif, puisque les structures sont aussi des acteurs économiques et environnementaux qui contribuent à la redynamisation de territoires souvent ruraux. Mais on constate aussi de la part d'une partie des populations des craintes, des inquiétudes liées notamment au profil des personnes accueillies. Et ça a pu se traduire dans les diverses expériences d'implantation que nous avons eues par des pétitions allant contre des projets, voire des manifestations ou encore des interpellations des élus euh, en les invitant à s'opposer à l'implantation de ces structures. Les premiers acteurs à convaincre pour implanter ce type de structure, ce sont les partenaires institutionnels qui vont donner les agréments permettant le fonctionnement de la structure. Il y a également les élus locaux, à l'échelle notamment de la municipalité, mais aussi du département, qui peuvent être des soutiens politiques importants. Il y a également le tissu associatif et économique local que nous essayons de convaincre du projet pour pouvoir s'ancrer positivement sur le territoire. Et il y a également les habitants de la commune, puisque l'idée est que les structures puissent être des lieux de vie ouvert sur l'extérieur et cela se fait principalement à travers l'intervention de bénévoles. De la part des opposants aux fermes, il y a des craintes qui sont liées à celles d'une hausse de l'insécurité. Il y a également des craintes qui peuvent être celles d'une dévaluation immobilière, notamment des habitations qui se situent à proximité des structures. Et il y a également une série de craintes qui peuvent venir du monde agricole, qui estime que le fait qu'une association fasse une activité agricole soit une forme de concurrence déloyale. Aujourd'hui, euh, ces craintes n'ont jamais été constatées dans la pratique sur les structures qui sont déjà en fonctionnement. Je pense que l'un des éléments clés pour faciliter l'implantation des structures, c'est d'être dès le départ dans une démarche de co-construction des projets dès leur démarrage avec l'ensemble des parties prenantes qui seront amenées à y intervenir. Il est également nécessaire de mettre en place dès le début une véritable stratégie de communication et de pédagogie pour sensibiliser le grand public et plus particulièrement les habitants autour des projets puisqu'il y a une méconnaissance extrêmement forte de la réalité du monde carcéral aujourd'hui et donc il s'agit plutôt de démystifier le public qui est accueilli au sein des fermes et de faire connaître ce qu'est la réalité aujourd'hui des personnes sortant de prison. L'idée également c'est de rationaliser le débat c'est-à-dire de revenir, de donner des faits, des chiffres sur la récidive, sur la réinsertion, sur la délinquance, pour mettre en avant l'impact positif sur la récidive des aménagements de peine versus les sorties sèches de détention sans accompagnement. Nous nous appuyons également sur des témoignages de structures existantes, de montrer que les structures aujourd'hui ne sont plus expérimentales, mais qu'on a un vrai recul avec plusieurs structures en fonctionnement, ce qui nous permet de donner des exemples positifs. Les relations sont très positives aujourd'hui sur les fermes qui sont implantées. Les structures sont par ailleurs des acteurs économiques des territoires qui proposent l'accès à une alimentation saine, biologique, en circuit court pour les habitants ou qui contribuent notamment à développer l'emploi local. On est vraiment convaincu que sur les fermes, l'objectif c'est de créer la rencontre entre les résidents et les habitants et que c'est par cette rencontre que les regards de chacun sur l'autre vont permettre de changer et d'évoluer. Uh, Anke, you're an organization, organizational psychologist and group mediator, uh, but you also are a developer of the new route because you have a, a method of community involvement, not necessarily for building a prison, but for something you develop uh, in a community, you are going to present us four steps you have to take. I would say uh, share your screen and take it away. Okay, thank you. So... I want to talk to you about new root decision making. And it's not especially about uh, this theme that we're talking about today. Also, I am part of the rescaled community, but this is not especially made for rescaled houses. I want to talk to you about new root decision making. My name is Anke Sievers. I'm the founder of new root decision making because I found that the way we come to large scale decisions no longer fit the needs of the people in our society. 
the way we shape decision making processes, because that's what I'm talking about, not only involving, but really making decisions together. It stems from the Industrial Revolution, a time where we thought differently and had different um, and less possibilities. Well, with me in this photo, you see uh, Gert-Jan Slump, maybe known to a lot of you, from Restorative Justice in the Netherlands. And together we founded Community Processing. Community Processing is a new root approach that focuses on large-scale situations where groups have disagreements and tensions or conflicts about a particular issue. So that issue could also be that there would be a detention house in their neighborhood, in their backyard. Okay, so earlier on you have seen the video of Marion Moulin. I had the chance to look at it earlier so I could, could react on it. And uh, she was explaining the challenges that small scale detention house face, what steps they take uh, to realize their project and how uh, the community reacts. So I want to give a little um, feedback on that. Um, they have to convince the institutional partners who have to give the required permits and approvals and they have to win over the locally elected officials because you also need your um, political support and then last but not least you have the people who live in the area because if you do not win them over they can cause a lot of trouble and in my humble opinion they have every right to do so Maybe that's weird to say here, but I think they have all the right to do so. The reactions of communities are sometimes positive, but often people start petitions, they organize demonstrations against the building and the opening of the facility, they pressure elected officials to vote against it, or they create negative media attention, because that's the power that, that people have. And it's understandable that people are not anxious to open an institution for inmates in their area. They run the risk that the value of their homes will drop, that it will fall. They are concerned about their safety or the safety of their loved ones. Um, they are afraid that their environment will become less pleasant, that they will, there will be disturbances in their street or their village. And we don't only see this in rescale detention houses, but everywhere where top-down decision, decisions are being made uh, that involve our environment, that involve our surroundings. So everywhere where top-down decisions are made, you see this same movement that people start, stand up and react against it. And it's also in uh, 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 physical um, and, and health care uh, facilities, you also see this same problem or where um, people with um, other abilities or different uh, disabilities are being held. Um, what is becoming increasingly clear is that there is a growing resistance to the fact that others determine what happened in our neighborhoods. Uh, if others decide for you, you lose ownership we have created and perfected a system over more than 100 years in which it is common for there to be parties who decide and parties who mainly implement and have to live with what is decided for them. So I want to talk to you about ownership. Ownership is having control, being able to determine. So I'm, I'm just putting my hand like this because it's the, the upper side of ownership is being able to determine the things that matter to you. From there, you are prepared to also bear the consequences of the decision because you were part of the decision. From there, you are prepared to implement the decision in your work or your life. You want to take responsibility. So the decisions and responsibility are linked together. They, together, they form ownership. It's not one or the other, it is together. Um, but it starts with having the decision-making power. Uh, I have a short video to show you about large-scale issues where we introduced the new route in decision-making. So that could be 
there could be shared ownership and a well-supported plan by all who, was, who, who were involved and were hurt in the issue of a hospital bankruptcy. So I'm gonna show you this video now. What you just saw was the first community process. And what we did was the following. We turned around the decision-making process in its base. Usually people are taking, um, are asked to give their opinions about an issue, to think along, to share ideas. And then these opinions and, uh, and ideas will be taken into consideration by the usual decision-makers. Then the usual decision-makers, they make the decision but we wanted to restore ownership for everybody. In the new route, we start, and that's what you see on the right here, you start with the usual decision makers because they are the ones who know the framework, the law, the amount of money there is. And we start by making the framework really clear so that everybody later on will know what is possible and what is not. Then we start the process that ensures that everybody who thinks something or has an idea about this issue can also participate <laughs> in the decision making. In community processing, everybody is very carefully prepared and we organize a large meeting where everybody can reach decisions together. This is the overall tilt I, I showed you about, and this is the new root decision making, a real tilt in decision making. So now I will take you closer, take a closer look with you at the process. For example, we have a small det detention center 
a small scale detention center and it should be established in a village. There are people who look forward to it, but there's also, there are also people who demonstrate against it. The clear overarching central question is in a new route process, what is needed so that we all feel well in this situation or, or what is needed so that it, it will keep us going well in this situation. The central question in a community process is always about the well-being of everybody involved. The next step is to provide a clear demarcation. The usual decision makers need to commit to the new route in decision making in this issue. They need to also commit to the outcomes of the plan when the demarcation is met. They will commit to the route and to the actual plan that will be made if it is within the boundaries they have set. Then we have the preparatory phase. This is a very important phase. Often for people, this is the first time they feel taken seriously in their involvement in this issue. Often this is the first time they are approached to speak up and be heard. The preparation meeting is a conversation with all who are involved about this process. Um, this sometimes happens in small groups and sometimes it happens with individuals, just what they need. The goal is to prepare everybody to be ready to have a say and speak up during the decision-making gathering. That is to come, to explain the process rules and, and the demarcation so everybody is really well prepared. And also three questions are central. Who else is involved? That's asked, um, everybody's asked the same question. Who else is involved? So we find everybody who has a saying about this. We are widening the circle around this issue. Then we ask what information needs to be presented during this gathering? Because people can have good ideas if they have all the information. We just talked about that also. And what do you need to participate safely is also a very important question because people can have fears. Uh, not only about what uh, this small scale detention house, but also what will happen in this decision making process. So during this preparing conversation, the feeling of powerlessness turns into motivation to work on a solution together. Instead of blaming each other and fighting each other's opinion, people start realizing that this issue is something that they all share and that the issue bothers everybody in this case. In this preparation conversation, we start the transformation from debate into dialogue, from resistance into energy. This is a very important phase, yet it is the first thing that local governments and organizations skip and take out of the process because it takes a lot of time. I find that we as organizations and as society, we easily forget how much time and energy it costs us not to come to a shared opinion, not to come to a shared decision. If people do not agree with a decision that involves them and that is made for them, they tend to boycott the decision in implementing and, implementing and in practice. It does not take a lot of time to make a decision for people, but it costs a lot of time. If people um, don't agree with a decision and, and to get the people to, degree, to agree with a decision that is made for them. So skipping this phase, because it takes too much time, it will actually delay the process in the long run. Last but not least, there's of course the decision-making gathering. And the decision-making gathering can have all different forms uh, depending on the issue, depending on the number of people, depending on what kind of people are involved and depending on the needs of the people that are involved. Well, with this, I will end this presentation for now. Also, the video that you showed there, uh, therein are some really, really angry people. Right. That um, uh, I sometimes think, yeah, whatever you say, they will always be angry. No, they um, won't, yeah. Should, uh, uh, am I too pessimistic or are you too optimistic that I think, yeah. 
I, I think say? you just don't have the experience with with a large in this situation in this new route, because it's not that people just turn around and be happy are happy together. It takes a lot of work and it takes a process with, that takes them really seriously. So that's why I, I emphasize the importance of the preparation phase. But also you could say, now we're going to spend a lot of time and energy on a, a small group of people that are really angry and it will take a lot of time and difficulties to, to also uh, convince them it's not a problem. Uh, is it important that no one is left behind or should you say, okay, we have 75% of people who agree we have a majority, let's leave a little group that will never be satisfied to side or never leave anyone well, it's, behind. It's really important because in deep democracy, they have a saying that if you ignore the minority, that will be your assistance in the future. Now, it's okay. very important that you you take everybody's voice and you, you listen to everybody. And it's not that um, they will get what they want from the beginning, but a lot of resistance comes from we are not heard. We are not heard. Okay. So in a way it is... Uh, uh a harder challenge you give us because don't focus on the majority of people, focus also on those few people that might be really, really, really difficult to uh, uh, involve. But you say it's doable when yeah. people at least feel they're heard, they start listening and you can have a dialogue with them. Well, it's not even, not only about feeling hurt, it's about that you really tilt the decision-making process and you, you uh, set clear boundaries so everybody has, um, how do you say that? A fair game. You create a fair game. Okay. Well, this sounds. Uh, so it's 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 both optimistic and both also a big challenge you're giving it's a us. Big challenge. Um, what, what was the most uh, what, what was the most interesting part for you? Uh, the most interesting part was to really see and look at the community itself, see its hierarchy and its structure. Really trying to find allies within the community as well, and trying to identify which activities and which needs can be met by both sides. So if there are specific needs by the community, a grocery shop or whatever services that a detention house can offer, try to see with them what those can be in order to have a win-win situation for both and really try to present it as such. Okay, if we go into a village with, we want to build this prison, uh, or if we say, let's have a discussion and see, um, it could also be the conclusion, no, this is not good for this community. Is that a much better starting point? I don't know. I think you 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 cannot choose on your starting point lots of times. So both starting po points are possible, but actually community processing is a decision making process. It's not a, a process where um, you do research. It's not a research process. It's it's decision making, and decision making is very important to get a plain level a level field where in, uh, you can decide together and you can empower people who feel a lot of times uh, not empowered by top-down decisions. In many of these participation processes, authorities have decided something is going to happen, we're going to build a prison, and then the, the community can decide whether we paint the doors blue or red. Yeah, but uh, that's why this is not a participation it, process. This is a decision-making process. And also decision could be in the end, this is not for our village, this is... I think if you ask a question, do you want to have a prison or not? You could do that. And then maybe you, you will have yes or you have a no. But actually, most of the times, um, it will go another way around. There is decided that there will be something. Uh, because as a society, we have people who need to go to prison. We have people who have disabilities. We have people who have drug problems. We have people who live on the streets who need a place to live. And nobody wants that in their backyard. So if you ask me, do you want that in your backyard? I would say no. Okay. But if the question is- Already the, the starting point is a very decisive point for if we are too open, we might get nowhere. But if we are already too fixed and people can already de decide the details, right. we're also yeah. getting nowhere. So we're also getting nowhere. We like to talk about content. We like to talk about solutions, but actually this is not about solutions. This is about creating a process, facilitating a process so that the community can think about content and the community and everybody who's involved. So all stakeholders can think about solutions that fit them. 
it's really important that we stop thinking about ideas for other people. We do not want to make the same mistake. What is the main conclusion for this? If we, as Rescaled, want to build more small-scale facilities in all countries of Europe and beyond, and we want to involve the community in a meaningful and successful way to get rid of this NIMBY behavior, and even maybe in a way not only to take away resistance, but also build trust and build a better community-based uh, house. What is the main lesson from the last hour that we need to take into account? Oh, my, my main takeaway is that uh, it's important to uh, listen to the people to the, in the community and uh, may, let them make come with decisions for how they want it in the society, in their society. Almost none of these fears ever substantiated. Nothing ever. People are afraid of a lot of things, but it never happens. Uh, do we have to provide more facts or more emotions to make people less afraid of this? To be convinced of something, usually we think we have to present facts, but it's much more about feelings. And if you see, and that's also in Roger's example, he told us about uh, an, um, um, a small-scale uh, facility somewhere in, the, in Stockholm, I think, Roger, where people got in contact through... Uh, um, a brasserie, uh, I don't know, I don't remember the exact name, but it's feeling, it's about it, every um, fear usually is a feeling and you need to, to feel and you see and, and have examples, but not only uh, you persuade people don't, not only with facts. Yeah, no, I just, I just was thinking we're giving everybody a voice, except the really ones. Right who should live there, it, it could be handy to give them a voice in the process too. Just but, but, to let other people know that they are not monsters. Of course. Okay. If Actually, just that, that should be a lot already. Okay, so if a you, lot of nodding faces. This is a very important If you have the thing. preparation phase in a community process, you ask everybody, what do you want to know? What information do you want to have? And usually they say, who are those people? Yeah. Can you I tell can, me something about that? No. So then, you let these people in and you say, you ask for this information. You wanted to know who would be here. And so it's asked information. It's very important that you don't force this information onto the people, but you, you have them ask for it. I take away from this, from this meeting that community and uh, NIMBY arguments will be inevitable. They will be there and they might be a bad thing because a few angry people can stop a very important project, but they could also be very important. Basically, if our houses are really community integrated and not just some house somewhere with a big fence around it with no interaction with the surrounding, then it's not a real rescaled project. So it needs to have interaction. And of course, that means that people are concerned about it. You could even say, if no one's in concern, then are we doing something wrong? And solving this will take time it will take effort. We should. It takes rethinking from the first question we're asking. How should we formulate that? We have to rethink everything. But if we do that, this is our only way to really build community integrated houses. So from NIMBY to YIMBY is not only something good for our villages, but also maybe for ourselves and our thinking. Thank you so much for being here. And for now, have a great, have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.